Hi everyone, it's Eve Eltley Blots from spiritgirl.com and welcome to the Spirit Girl Talk Show podcast. I'm super excited to be here with you today and our very special guest who is Sue Stewart Smith, a psychiatrist, psychotherapist, and author of The Well Garden Mind, a Sunday Times bestseller and listed as one of the 37 best books of 2020 by the Times and the gardening book of the year by the Sunday Times. And the great news is The Well Garden Mind is now available on audio so you can do your gardening and listen to Sue Stewart-Smith. But Sue, welcome to the Spirit Girl podcast show. It's an honour and I'm super grateful to have you here. Oh, Yvette, thank you for asking me. I'm really delighted to be joining you today. Yes, well, I know all of our audience will be super excited you're here because I've had many of our Spark Girl book club community and podcast listeners who have been buying your book from Booktopia already, reading it and loving it. So naturally, I wanted to share more about you and your book and the benefits of gardening and connecting with nature and what it can do to our mental health or for our mental health. So Sue, before we dive into your book, are you happy to tell our audience a little bit about yourself? Absolutely, yes. I mean, I, I um, where, where do I start really? I think um, anyone who's read the, read the book will, will know that I, I actually started out reading English. I did an English literature degree um uh at cambridge and um it was really only when my my father became very ill and died uh, towards the end of my my um studies uh at university that i began to think about, about training as a doctor i'd loved i'd loved reading english and, and i still i still read a lot um but uh but i felt i wanted to do something that was really engaging with 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 other people and I suppose you know help helping helping people, so so I went to, I changed and I uh, finished my degree and studied medicine and then realised that what I was interested in most was the mind, and uh, I became a psychiatrist and and then a psychotherapist. So I did a very long training, and um, and actually in a funny way I feel that sort of brought me full circle because psychotherapy is so much about people's life narratives you know and in a way it sort of brought me back to the idea of, of, of people's life stories um you know the link with with literature and um and and storytelling so so that that's that's sort of my my background my journey in terms of my profession in my personal wow. life which is equally important for this book because really the book brings together the two sides of my life um I, I met my husband Tom when we were both at Cambridge. Uh, he at that point uh, was just setting out on uh, training to be a landscape architect and, uh, and we married quite young. We married in our mid-twenties and, and we're incredibly fortunate. His family have a, a, a plot of land about 20 miles north of London in Hertfordshire where his parents had a barn that was falling down. And his father had the idea of converting it, of saving it. And we got the opportunity to, to live there, um, which we, so we moved, we're still here. It's where I'm talking to you from. Uh, wow. We moved here in 1987. And, uh, and then slowly, very, very slowly began creating a garden around it because the, the barn was situated in, um, a, on top of a very windy hill. So it was very exposed. Uh, north facing hill um so we little by little we created shelter and created gardens and all the while tom was developing his career as a as a as a garden designer and and you know in the course of time he's become very well recognized um and and successful so so it's been an extraordinary journey really that we've been on together in that respect and and the book the book does reflect that i think my my um my journey too because i was actually quite skeptical about gardening when i first married tom bizarre as it may sound uh i saw it as something a bit like out outdoor housework i didn't really <laughs> understand. i didn't really connect with the soil and um 
yeah, it, it took a while, and and once, but once I started actually germinating plants from seed, uh, I, I I was hooked. So eventually, eventually, it got to me. Wow, that's an incredible journey. And first of all, Sue, sorry to hear about your loss of your father. That would have been really difficult um, at that time, and I'm sure many of our listeners can resonate with uh, loss at some point in their life or, or most recently. And Sue, it's so interesting that I've seen videos of your garden, I've seen many photos of your garden, and it's just so beautiful. It's so, oh, it's so like everything we dream of when it comes to the British country style mm -hmm. magazines or the country life, you know. It's um, really beautiful. So when you went there to this barn, obviously you're looking at this land. Did you over the years just plant different things and like obviously with your husband map out where things were going? How did that process mm -hmm. work? It has to be said that the the design of the garden is very much Tom's creative vision, you know, and he he he's a real plantsman. He knows a great deal about plants, and 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 in that respect, I've always been sort of tagging along behind him. I would say, and for me to see to see to see those changes um, uh, has been extraordinary, really. And I've obviously learnt a huge amount from him. Um, in terms of how we garden here, I think what what um for the, the sort of area of the garden that, that I I sort of ha have most um most influence over and spend most time in and and really kind of you know plan and and, and create myself is is our vegetable garden and and that's that's really what I think you know hooked me into gardening because I I've always loved cooking and and for me that connection between the garden and food was enormously important um, sort of you know early on when, when I was beginning to get excited about gardening so so that's also a very very important aspect of it for me but even so in the in the veg garden I grow lots and lots of flowers as well because I love cutting flowers and bringing them into the house so it's not an entirely productive garden there's also a, a great deal of um, uh, sort of color and, and and beauty in it well, your face is glowing with happiness and joy and fulfillment. And I can't help think, when you're doing this gardening, when it comes to the benefits of our mental health, is it really like that dopamine effect or the feeling of well-being um, where you plant a little seedling, you get to nurture it, and then eventually you get to watch it either grow into a vegetable or a beautiful flower and you feel that reward. How does that process work, Sue, with our mental health? I think, I think the, the really extraordinary thing about gardening is the many different levels on which it helps us. So, yes, you're right, there's a, you know, there's a, there's a physiological level and a, and a brain chemistry level. Um, which would it, it certainly involves our our reward systems, our dopamine systems, you know, because one of the great things about gardening is that it, it's intrinsically forward looking. You know, when we sow our seeds, we're part of our mind is engaging in the future in a positive way. We're looking forward two or three months and, you know, anticipating whether it's the produce, the, you know, the, the tomatoes or the squash plants or, or the beautiful flowers. So, so that effect is a very powerful one, and I think it's it's undoubtedly really come into its own with the pandemic that we're we, that we're, we're we're living through at the moment. You know, if you think certainly last spring in the northern hemisphere, people were sowing seeds. I mean, the garden centres couldn't keep up with the, with the demand, and and if you think about it, everybody everybody was firstly very afraid. Um, uh, but also they couldn't look forward to anything because all our all our plans were cancelled. Everything was 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 postponed or cancelled. But gardens gave people a way of of shaping a little bit of a, a future for themselves. So so that's that's a very important 
aspect of the therapeutic um, dimension to gardening. But the but the other the other aspect I think you mentioned care and I think culturally, you know, we live in a world that is so much caught up with consumption um, that that cares cares not been cares come to be devalued in a way uh, or not seen as something that might be might boost our self esteem or um, you know have intrinsic rewards to it. It's very easy these days to see care as something that's a sort of um, a, a demeaning activity or a, or a depleting activity, you know, sort of drains our energies. Uh, and, and of course, care can be, you know, if you take on too much, it, 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 it will be, or too much is imposed on you. But small acts of care are, are, are bound up with our endorphin system, so our, our natural opioids. So, so, so that, that in itself has a kind of a, a mood boosting, anti-stress, uh, pleasurable um, uh, aspects to it. But you know, gardening also, I think, puts us in touch with, with, with much deeper um, existential uh, issues, uh, you know, about the source of life um, and the cycle of life. So I, I think in terms of how gardening can help people recover from experiences of trauma or loss, uh, that working with the working with the, the the cycle of regeneration and and then decline and and decay in the garden and then renewal again is is fundamentally so important um, in terms of uh, just giving a sense of hope but also helping us accept that um, you know we're biological beings too and um, there, there is no escaping the fact that things die in the garden. Um, so I think it's a place where we can reconcile ourselves to all sorts of fundamental realities, actually. Yeah, wow, Sue. So in when we're in... Way, you know, I think gardening helps yeah. people do that in a very gentle way. A garden is a very safe setting. It's a very soothing setting. Or, or, you know, I mean, a, a, as long as it's not a massively overgrown garden that's, you know, <laughs> fill, one with, fill you with dread, as it were, about what, how on earth you're going to tackle it. But, but, you know, on the whole, you know, a beautiful garden is about the most, yeah, the safest and most sort of um, soothing setting you could, you could find yourself in. Yeah, and calming, isn't it? Very calming yeah. and tranquil. And it's interesting, Sue, you talked about um, their very healing. I've heard many people who have lost a loved one and talked about planting trees and on a of their loved one or rose um, yep. bushes yep. or flowers and and things yep. like that or many people suffering um, loss and going through grief and depression spending time in the garden and that helping with their rehabilitation I um, think that's right I mm. think I think working with the natural world connecting with nature in that way it, it um it exposes us to the transience of life. You know, everything's always changing in the garden. You know, the flower that blooms doesn't bloom for that long. You, you have to come into that moment and value it for that moment. But we, we also experience a sense of the continuity of life at the same time. And that combination of transience on the one hand and continuity on the other. Um, I, I, you know, I talk in the book about yeah. symbolic survival. So what you're talking about, planting a tree in memory of a a loved one and is is about symbolic survival the idea that something survives which is enormously important to us in in dealing with grief mm. and you know so it's interesting we're talking about you t touched on this earlier about vegetables and you loving um uh, growing them and then cooking with them and my auntie messaged me today and my uncle's visiting and She's going out to her garden and getting her pumpkin and she's making pumpkin soup for him and she's so excited and she's just, it's, she's beside herself because she's so happy that this pumpkin's grown and the reward of going to get it mm. out and then making it for family um, pumpkin soup. So I can see why you get so excited and many of our listeners um, creating, growing your own produce 
yeah. and then getting it out and then and then being able to eat it and cook with it and share it it's just so um so incredible it's 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 about recognizing what nourishes us i think um and and at every level you know that's not just food i think you know natural beauty or beauty in any form really is a, is a form of nourishment you, you know the effects on the brain uh, make that clear um uh that uh um that 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 sort of yeah being able to nourish ourselves um through the garden is 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 enormously helpful and i think it uh, you know in this pandemic time when people are so socially isolated there's also a form of companionship that people can experience through plants and through their gardens. Um, and that's, that's you know, again, I touch on that in the book because that's an enormously important effect for, for people who are in hospital, for example, or towards the end of life, you know, the, the, the very real value of gardens in those settings um, is I think finally coming to be recognized uh, after, after, you know, half a century, I think, of, of, of gardens really not being incorporated into healthcare. Um, you know, they're coming back again. Um, you know, of course, they had their great heyday in the in the Victorian era and and uh, before that. Um, but I think it's good. I think we we are we are recognizing the importance of all these things um, in a new way. Yes. Yeah, so your book has really highlighted the importance of gardening or really made us all think if we don't have a garden how can we get involved in gardening whether that's a community garden or how can we get in touch with nature and so many people we're seeing over in places like Japan they're going out to um, nature leaving the high rise um Many people in New York City are trying to get to Central Park and other places people are trying to bring plants in. Um, would you say, Sue, when you're working with the soil, however, it's very grounding um, or just even being in nature in general, isn't it? It can be very calming for our central nervous system and very grounding. Yes, I, th I think it is, and there's a, a lot of interesting research on the um, the effects of, of nature, for example, on our, on our attention. So, you know, the nature of 21st, well, much 21st century life and, and working life is that, particularly screen-based life, um, we're really only using one part of our brain a lot of the time. Um, and uh, you know our focus gets fragmented. We switch from one one task to another. Um, we're, we're 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 engaging quite a narrow focus in in terms of our attention. Um, and when when we when we go out into nature, the brain the brain um, employs a different kind of attention. It, it, it's really what, what you know we we evolved as hunter gatherers. So this is what our hunter gatherer forebears. Um, were using, you know, when they were walking out in the landscape, a very broad, broad form of attention, which is involves involves the brain in a much more integrated way, much more multi-sensory way. Um, you know, we're not we're not focusing in on one tiny thing, taking in the whole the whole landscape, if you like. And 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 there's also evidence that the patterns in nature, the fractal patterns in the in the trees, the branches. Um, these are these are patterns that are, are um, that repeat themselves. You know that like the way a tree branches and then the leaves. Actually, if you look on the leaf, you almost see in miniature the the the, the same branching structure of the tree. So nature is full of fractal patterns, and these are much ah. easier, much less demanding on the brain to read. Um, so our urban landscapes are full of kind of irregular, unnatural sort of shapes, if you like. Um, uh, and it's it's just simply a bit harder work. The eye has to make many more fixations to read to read an urban landscape than a natural landscape. So so this this effect is happening, you know, on, on at such a such a sort of multi level, uh, you know, uh, basis really. Um, that um, yeah, that it's uh, you know, it's one of the things I really try to 
dig into in my book, you know, is 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 these many different aspects of it. Um, and and you know, it's why it took me a long time to research the book. I spent five years researching the book. Well, I'm just fascinated, Sue, with your book. You have been doing psychiatry for so long um, in your role, but how did the book come about with the title uh, and the whole book come to fruition? When did you decide, all right, I'm going to sit down and write a book? Um, well, that's, that's, that's a good question because... Um, I don't know. I think I think I like to think I might have written the book anyway. But but it, it, it came about. The idea really came about in 2013 when um, uh, a friend of ours called Christopher Woodward, who's the director of the Garden Museum in London, um, approached Tom and me about um, running a, a small festival, a summer festival, a literary festival in our garden. And um, we were we were delighted by the idea. And at the very first planning meeting, he he said to me, "Oh, and Sue, I think you're going to talk about gardening for the mind." And I said, sort of thought, "Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, <laughs> I could do, do that. I'd like to do that." Um, so I set about writing this talk, and it was really in writing that talk that um, that I realised how how much I had to say about it, and and how I think quietly I had been thinking about it without being really aware of it, you know. Um, I'd always seen my gardening life as separate from my working life. Uh, but I think I had been, you know, weaving the two together in my own mind. Um, not not particularly consciously, but but it was it, it, it was as if it surfaced. And, and I'm very grateful to Christopher for sowing that seed, actually, um, and getting me going. But but also the other thing that was really important about that was was in the course of writing that talk, I I sort of reconnected with my grandfather's story, which was very much one of the inspirations behind the book, and uh, and I went you know to find out more from my mother because I'd I'd grown up knowing that uh, he had suffered terribly during the First World War, as a very young man um, he'd been captured in Turkey in the run up to the Gallipoli invasion. He'd, um, he'd spent the, the whole of the First World War in a, a series of brutal labor camps. Uh, and he was lucky to survive, but he was very, very um, malnourished and, and traumatized at the end of the war. And it was really only in 1920 when he got the opportunity to, to um, enroll on a year long course of horticultural rehabilitation that he began to recover his, fully recover his physical and and mental health. You know, my, my grandmother had nursed him uh, before that and really helped him a great deal. But but that that um, that that was life changing for him. And 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 he was left with a lifelong love of gardening. And my mother grew up on a small holding. And, and during the Second World War, you know, the family were pretty self sufficient. Um, and they had bees and an orchard and kept a pig and so on, as well as growing lots of food. So, so I, that was there in my background, but it was very much as kind of latent. It was latent in me, and 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 uh, and that that also came up to the surface, and I began to think about that, and and I started researching. Uh, I, I, you know, that's it, that stories in the book. I find the place where he did he did that course and um, uh, learn a bit more about his experiences um, and write about them. So, so yeah, the book, the book was quite a journey for me, really. Wow, that's such an incredible story, Sue. Just hearing about your uh, grandfather's story, when we, when we look at recovering from trauma, and back in those days, there is wasn't the treatment there is today with the modern, you know, medication and um, the psychiatrist at the ready um, or psychologist. And to think that the power of horticultural and gardening could help rehabilitate him from the war and the torture and um, all of the trauma it's really reassuring and especially now with all your research and personal experience really reassuring for anyone who's tuning in 
and going through a really difficult time and um, maybe has a garden and not been in there or, you know, it's reassuring that there's always hope, isn't there, in, and especially can be found in the garden or by gardening and really that therapeutic way. Yeah. No, I think I think that is. I think um, I think I would add something to that, which is mm. that you know I visited an, um, a lot of mental health projects, including some projects for for veterans recovering from mm. PTSD and, and and servicemen as well. Um, and I think I think that you know there's there's people's own personal gardens on the one hand, and 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 how much they can benefit from it as an individual. But the, there's also something else that happens in, let's say, a community garden or, or a more formal therapeutic project, which is, which is also about the human element. And, and um, gardens have a, a, very, a very unique way, I think, of helping people connect with each other. You know, they're an, they're an unthreatening space. Um, and I mentioned before the safety people feel in the garden. That's really crucial for, for anyone recovering from PTSD, for example. Uh, the feeling of, of enclosure that you can have in a garden. Mm -hmm. Enclosure, but there's an element of openness too. You're not sort of trapped. But, but you know, I was really struck um, and, and learned a lot from the horticultural therapists who I met in the course of uh, writing the book. You know that the skill that they bring to creating a therapeutic environment within a garden is 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 an enormously important part of it. You know, and I'm sure my grandfather had that. I mean, what, one of the things that came to light was um, uh, from by my cousin was the letter that that he was uh, given at the end, written by his um, his instructor, as it were. You know, and it sort of detailed the kind of experiences that he'd had, what he'd learned to grow. Um, he'd actually learned to grow a lot of exotic plants in this place as well, because it was a really amazing garden with lots of glass houses. Um, but it, I, it struck me reading this letter, because it's a nice letter written about him, you know, that his relationship with that um, uh, instructor must have also been important. And, and I think it's one, one thing is I really do feel very strongly in terms of us coming out of this pandemic and, and the social isolation uh, that that we've all experienced is that community gardening could really have a great deal to offer people because because it, it it's a it's a it's a, it's a sort of it and in the context of the virus particularly it will feel like a very unthreatening way for people to come together or a safe way for people to come together you know, with shared tasks shared shared pleasures so much of gardening is about shared shared pleasures whether that's in the food or or the beauty uh, that that's being created, um, so so yeah, I think I think one has to think about that as well, and the way that human connection is actually fostered through through connection with nature. Wow, Sue, I just listening to your words there couldn't help think when it comes to the recovery and mental health. Uh, overcoming trauma um, and overcoming so many things that people are going through because like you said there are people returning from war or people who are uh, got um, post-traumatic stress disorder from whatever um, trauma they've gone through so we've always had these things happening in the community and it's now been escalated through COVID-19. But coming together as a community and being self-sufficient and gathering and it just seems like such an incredible way to um, reconnect because you're right, in person and in the garden and... Um, it just sounds like a really marvellous thing to do. So I'm sure there'll be some of our podcast listeners that are like, oh, Sue, why didn't I think of that? And even if it's only with their gathering, um, even if they start out small with their family or their neighbours, you know, yeah. or their immediate people in their street if they don't want to take on the big council garden. Um, yeah, but, yeah. yeah. But this, yeah, these yeah. things can be very, very small. I mean, if, you know, um, 
I write about uh, the incredible edible project in the book, which started in Todmorden, just outside Manchester, and it was a, a group of a group of women who 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 wanted to, to help the town recover. It was a, a, a you know a town that had been um, languishing for some time, a sort of post-industrial uh, town, had been a thriving mill town once in the you know was it right at the heart of the industrial revolution way back. Um, but the crash of 2008 really hit it badly. And, and they just set out planting up um, neglected areas within the town and, and derelict areas, um, planting them up with, with food that people could, you know, forage for and harvest. You know, it, it was open to anybody to harvest and collect. And little things like they planted herbs outside the butcher's shop so that people could pick herbs on their way out of the shop. Um, and it's and it's you know it really kickstarted a bit of a transformation in in Todmorden, and 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 actually has gone on and spawned you know a worldwide movement of incredible edible gardens. So so there's a lot there's a lot that you can do that's you know very simple simple ways of people coming together, um, and and making these interventions really. Such a incredible story that one. I can't help think makes you want to run out. You feel so inspired to want to run out and do a little random act of kindness and start growing, you know, flowers around the place and herbs and and food. Um, so yeah, when I the the, the um the sort of the one of the sort of um slogans for the incredible edible is that they use the currency of kindness. That that's their that's their approach. Yeah, and it's beautiful. I think one of the things that a lot of people are sharing with me, Sue, is when they're growing their own vegetables or fruit, um, whatever it might be, they feel very empowered, like it doesn't matter what happens in the world, I'll be able to feed myself and my family. They feel like they're in control, like as long as I can create food and grow food I'm okay yeah is that a natural instinct yeah Yeah, I think it is and I think given the very uncertain times that we're living in um I think I find gardening very empowering I find um you know we're not self-sufficient by any means but we grow a lot um and and it, it 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 never it never ceases to sort of delight me and reward me um and yeah, I think that feeling of uh, yeah being able to stand on your own two feet in a way, you know, is 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 in a fundamental way, you know, feed yourself and feed your family is is um, is is a very important part of it. And and in terms of kind of gardening's potential to to have transformative effects on people, yeah, that that particular effect, that that empowering effect, that sort of um, self-esteem self-belief effect uh came across very very strongly in the interviews that i did with prisoners on gardening projects for example you know and and these were men and women who 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 wanted to change their lives but they couldn't really see how and but gardening gave them a sense of, of actually that they they could do something worthwhile they could produce something that would give somebody else pleasure as it were, or they could feel proud of at a fundamental level. And, and gardening is very good at that and, and very helpful for um, uh, kids, for example, and teenagers who, who are not thriving in the education system. You know, I, I feature a couple of projects working with at-risk kids. And again, that effect, that kind of getting their hands in the soil, engaging with, um, nature in a very physical way uh but at the end of the day of course not everything's under your control but but, but, that there is there is an element of control there you know and that's part of part of gardening too that you're constantly having to deal with things that aren't quite in your control um but but actually at the end of the day they can stand back and feel really proud of what they've done and and um that that self-esteem effect is is has many 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 applications um in terms of the therapeutics of gardening and and the kind of um uh you know people that it can benefit really or situations in which it can be beneficial that is incredible sue to hear of the transformations 
of the prisoners and when we reflect on uh, at-risk children or children who are in uh, very domestic violence or, or situations that are not um, good at all, but to see a sense of um, proudness and building their self-esteem and, and learning the whole process of the gardening must yeah. be so calming for them and that give them a sense of place. I mean, people often comment that, you know, in all these kind of projects that are, that are, there's very, very rarely any aggr aggression. Pe people don't argue in the garden or, or have yeah. aggression. You know, it, it's um, in terms of prisons, certainly, you know, that yes. pro projects report. There's really very little violence in the garden. And I think that, or no violence, it just helped the calming, the calming surroundings really, really help. But also the kind, the mindful focus on the work. You know, one of the things gardening's very helpful for is 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 getting into a flow state. Um, you know, because whether it's weeding uh, or let's say, you know, planting, potting up seed, little seedlings or sowing seeds. You know, the 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 focus, the the the, the brain hand mind connection body connection uh really that that's that that focus that's required uh is is very good at bringing us into the present moment um and what many people report in the garden is a feeling of of losing themselves in what they're doing um you know that, that somehow their their worries that may have been going over and over in their mind, or their self-critical thoughts, their negative thoughts, they, they they go a bit quiet when we're when we're engaged in those kind of activities. Um, you you can also you can also get that effect. Many people get it from cooking, for example. You know, which has a similar rhythmical, meditative, you know, hand-eye coordination uh, quality to it. So, so, so I think that's also a very, very important aspect of how how calming um, gardening can be. I think, and you're so right, Sue. That when you speak about that flow state, and then just when you're, you know, having a complete break from the news or the stress or the thoughts or whatever might be going on. It's so therapeutic, isn't it? And really great for our mental health and well-being. I think um, it's so mm. important in the world that we live in now because we're we're too many of us most of the time are too connected, aren't we? We know notifications come through on our phone and um even if you you're not intending to, you know, read the news as it were, it somehow pops up. Through. Yeah, it pops up. Uh, so I think having that break, uh, particularly from screens, is really beneficial, actually. Because, see, when I grew up, Sue, I was really blessed that every weekend I was always out gardening as a little kid, and I loved it. I just really enjoyed getting my hands in, um, doing the plants, watching them grow. It was like the highlight of my childhood. I'm positive that and reading books and sports. But... I really, really enjoyed it. I think I really liked the process of it being dirt and nothing, quite yeah. horrible. I used to think it was horrible, but then we would plant these little pretty plants, the little seeds. You know, I used to go and get the little packets at the, <laughs> uh, and it was so fascinating to put them in and you know, it was my job to keep them watered. And I learned if I overwatered the plants or the seedlings, they wouldn't grow. Um, <laughs> so I learned a lot. But just then watching them blossom to come out, you know, the purple and the pink yeah, and yeah. it was just yeah, such think, a beautiful experience as a kid too. Yes, and I think it's also gar gardening is um, about delayed gratification too, isn't it? And, and mm. we live in a world where, where you know, so dominated by sort of instant gratification so i think that's another very helpful aspect of it um uh and also that that lovely element of uh of novelty or surprise you get in a garden mm -hmm. you know you, 
you may have you've planted something months ago and maybe even forgotten about it a bit and then suddenly it comes into flower um and uh and you think oh wow yeah that's great um so so i think that's that's also that's also lovely you know i feel even in a small garden there's always quite a lot going on um and and you know you do get these lovely moments of surprise you know nature surprises us um and you and know, that's, that's good. And you know, so I think one of the things I learned, it was a good training um, ground to be in the gardening on the weekends because I learned from a young age I couldn't just sit inside and watch TV all day. I had to get outside. And because my mum was in the garden but sort of down the other end, I learned that you just had to attend to things. Now, I also learned that weeds came up and yes. whilst that was one of the most, as a kid, I just wanted to do the seeds and then, you know, water it and wait for it all to blossom. But I learned that to get to this beautiful flower or plant, I had to do those jobs like weeding mm -hmm. because if I didn't do it and let it overgrow, like it would, my flowers wouldn't come out. So it was very... Um, it's a really good thing, I think, learning as a child because now I've learned you've got to do in life yes. all these things that sometimes you really don't want to do, but it's necessary to sort of get to the end outcome of this beautiful yeah. flower. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But so it's like, you're right, it's not instant gratification, mm, but three so months down the track I yeah. could see the worth in doing yeah. those tasks that, um, you know, you tell a kid to go guard, uh, do weeding. That's the last thing we want to do on the weekend. I would yeah. rather even back in those days sit and watch cartoons or, you know, play with um, other kids. But it was just such a good upbringing to be in the garden and learn like we've got to you know look after this garden yes and you know I'm a, real, I'm a real advocate for 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 children and gardening and particularly school gardening because i think it's not only that effect that's so important i think given the given the you know the planetary crisis that we we're facing um you know the climate crisis and the biodiversity crisis i think it's so important that children connect with nature in that way and understand the cycle of life in the garden and the source of their food and and all these things so so i think it has many 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 um benefits to offer really at every level i think everyone's got to get a copy of your book the well um garden mind because it's just such a great read but what i love sue is you recorded it on audio and yes i was just i managed to do it just before the pandemic so i was really really i'm really pleased about that yeah yeah and it's incredible that your book came out so you're writing this not knowing that the global pandemic was hap going to happen and what people have expressed to me when they talk about your book is that it was like timely, a timely book. Yeah. Um, I always say divine timing because I'm seeing all these books pop up that can be so beneficial during the pandemic because when we think of mental health, sometimes yeah, you're a trained psychiatrist and we know about the medication and, and mm -hmm. that part, but to be able to combine lifestyle practices um, and combining all of these tools or things or practices is just um, really incredible and your book is so beneficial and really putting the spotlight on gardening but in a really therapeutic way for our mental health and well-being yeah, and just and giving I, us I so many to, ideas. Yeah. Mm. I want to create a book that kind of... Um, uh, you know, because there, there are quite a lot of life stories in it. Um, so people that I encountered and interviewed on the one hand, there's quite a lot of research in it in terms of the evidence. And also quite a few, lot about my own experiences in gardening. 
So I wanted to create a book that, that was both a kind of in-depth exploration of the value of gardening, but also in terms of reading it, um, gave people something of those experiences themselves, you know, that, that actually they would feel refreshed by, by reading, reading, you know, an account of some, something that I describe in the garden. So, so I was hoping to do that. And as you say, little, little, you know, how could any of us have seen what was coming mm. in terms of, of the moment that it, it was published? And, and actually I'd, I'd written in the book about um, uh, the phenomenon that's called urgent biophilia, which has been observed following wars, following natural disasters, uh, during wars as well. Um, and I'd, I'd really looked at that in relation to the First World War, you know, not only my grandfather's experience, but mm. other, other, other aspects of the turning to nature that happened during and after the First World War. Um, and biophilia is our love of nature, our innate love of nature. And, and it's clear that at times of crisis, you know, looking back through history, we see how, how this emerges. It, people almost instinctively feel the need to, to reconnect with nature. Um, and and you know the 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 renewal of nature that we can experience is is very sustaining to us in those kind of times. So I'd written all of this in the book, uh, little 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 knowing that that, that that the book would emerge during exactly you know during an unprecedented crisis really, when I think you know possibly our need for nature has been greater than in any other crisis. Um, that that humanity has has suffered because because you know during a war or following a natural disaster people can still come together they can still mm -hmm. they can hug each other they can go and get drunk together or what you know they can they can they can you know cry together they can con console each other they can they can have all that human connection that's so important um, uh, and we've been so deprived of that which has made the kind of the, you know, the, the experience of of anxiety and and trauma and losses that people have experienced in various ways so so much harder to deal with you're so right sue you really touched on something there like we're finding that we're going back to some form of nature to connect and i've spoken to people who are bringing plants in or gardening or going for walks in nature because they can't actually connect to, like you said, to a loved one and hug them because they can't travel and see them. Um, and so the isolation, whereas I have heard, like you mentioned just then, but in war times, you know, when the men or women would come back, they could, like you said, get together and rally, um, or you could come together as a group. But Many restrictions when London was in lockdown, um, they weren't, I did hear they were only, weren't allowed to drive around with a certain amount of people in the car. No, 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 we're still in lockdown. We're still not allowed to go into each other's houses. Yes. Um, two households are allowed to mix outdoors um, and restaurants and pubs are, uh, you know, providing food uh, and drink, but only outdoors. So, um, so we're hoping to emerge more fully from it in the middle of this month. Um, and then I think there's another level of restrictions lifting at the end of June. But, but no, we've, we've, had, we've had a really long period of lockdown. We had a long period at the beginning of the pandemic and we've had a long period this winter. Um, must be nearly, so, how many months is that now, Sue? That must be going on four, five... Uh, so, Four months, over four months, yeah. It's still a long time, isn't it, where like a neighbour who's one of the podcast listeners at the start of the UK pandemic, the lockdown, was saying she couldn't go into her neighbour's house at that time and they're an apartment complex. Yeah. Um, and I thought, oh, this is really cutting off social yes. connection, like... Back in the day, she um, would have, like, dinner with this lady because they were both on their own and, you know, drink and, and so forth and socialise. But um, really fascinating, Sue. I want to ask you, in your experience working in mental health, 
there's mixed emotions where people are saying it's good that people are openly talking about their mental health struggles or or concerns or illnesses or there's a big movement in trying to break the stigma. But then on the other hand, we've got people sadly uh, critically ill with mental health, um, mental illness, and we know that so many people who maybe never experienced mental health issues or concerns or illness before, it's been triggered by the pandemic. What's your thoughts on where this is all heading, I guess, for mental health and the need for, I guess, psychiatrists and and psychotherapists and psychologists, everyone I speak to will run off their feet really busy um they're saying that they're very concerned about mental health and the well-being of people i think it is a really serious concern and i think the um the mental health consequences of the pandemic are likely to last a lot longer than the 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 effects of the virus itself um, because there's been so many, so many, whether it's the economic effects, people losing jobs, people losing loved ones, people, people, you know, suffering long periods of, of isolation um, and disconnection. Uh, these have all taken a great deal of toll and, and living with um, so much uncertainty and anxiety and, and, and so many restrictions for such a long period of time. And, and I think some people are also certainly here. You know, I mentioned earlier that, the, the, you know, the, the gradual return coming out of lockdown that we're hoping will happen. But some people are very anxious about that as well because they've had many, many months of, of, um, of, of, uh, of lockdown life. And, and you know, there, there are also anxieties about you know, seeing people again and emerging. And, you know, it's not going to be easy at all. So I think the more we can just all keep talking about it and keep it on on the agenda, uh, you know, I think one of one of the good things in a way is that it's that where whereas perhaps in other situations people might not have, not have been able to speak so openly about their mental health struggles. I think the pandemic has made it all right because the everybody has been anxious. Um, and and therefore there's less stigma attached to you know less sense of weakness as it were or something that uh, that you know expressing anxiety um but i think i think in terms of thinking about resources and strategies you know it's really it's really got to be high up on on the agenda um as we come out of this yeah I so- just to add, i do think one of the other other you know positive aspects of the pandemic has been uh, the very widespread around the world uh, phenomenon of, of, of reawakening to, to the importance of nature and connection to nature for our, for our well-being. Um, so, I, you know, again, I think it's just important that we keep, keep that going, keep the momentum going with that um, and, and don't, don't lose sight of it uh, too quickly. Yeah, thank you, Sue, for sharing your words of wisdom because that was a real reason I wanted to have you on the podcast show because the well garden mind, whether people read it, whether they have it in audio book, whether they just feel inspired and empowered today to think about how they can do gardening, how they can connect to nature how can they really just use that to help with their mental health and well-being um, during the pandemic and beyond because it's just so therapeutic and and so beneficial, like you said, the calming nature, helping to ease uh, anxiety and overcome trauma and, you know, help with grief and depression and just the people I'm speaking to along with yourself, Sue, who are gardening, mm. they feel very optimistic. They feel like they're in control of it, their garden. 
and they've got a real sense of purpose. And then on the flip side, we can't travel international and our international borders are closed. Whilst I would normally travel international, I've accepted I can't and it is what it is. And that's kind of like I had to have that very approach because if I really went down the rabbit hole of I can't travel international, some people have gone down the rabbit hole and gotten really depressed about it and feeling very depressed. I mean, I had my moments of depression that I can't travel international. I'm sure we've all had that, but I decided that you've got to focus on what you can do. Yeah, what you can do. What you can't do. What's local, what's, um, you know, I think this thing about, yeah, I think if, if you've got access to a garden, it, it does potentially offer you um, a little microcosm, you know, a little, a little, a little world that you can explore and, and notice. And a lot, lot of wildlife comes into a garden, um, and you know, increasingly people are, are planting more and more. Um, you know, the, the planting to encourage biodiversity, planting to encourage the insects, the birds, and so on. And that's really helpful for the for these kind of times because the more life that comes into a garden you know the more we can experience in a sense you know do a little travel around your garden every day when you can't travel very far um and you know one of the examples i give in the book is sigmund freud who for the last 16 years of his life was forbidden to travel because of his health and um you know the garden and the villas that he rented each summer were enormously important to him and he would he, he would walk walk around the garden every day noticing what had changed, what was going on, and, and spent a lot of time on his garden bed, actually, outdoors, just just taking in all, all those changes. You know, often, often we're too busy to notice these things or we're rushing from A to B. So, so there's a lot, that, lot by slowing down that you can notice if you've got a little bit of nature around you. I love that, by slowing down. Um, and a little bit of nature around you and incredible stories Sue in your book and incredible that you went to all of the research and then really put like a, a somewhat memoir intertwined with mental health and well-being with real life stories and projects and there's so much work that's gone into your book Sue and I thank you because it's now such a gift. It really is such a gift. And we're all blessed that you went to all of the effort to do all of the work to pull it together um, because it, it, there's such a variety and diversity in there. And, like, it's incredible. One minute you're talking about these, you know, little rack, acts of kindness projects and then, your grandfather and um, just so many elements. So, Sue, I could talk to you forever about gardening because I just love it, obviously. But when I'm thinking of my mental health podcast and, and the reason I have you on and many other authors, I look at mental health just not from uh, a one dimension, you know, um, just not medication or just not counselling, you know, like a very holistic approach where it's medication or counselling or food or gardening or all walking, these things, you know. Right. It, yeah, they yes. all help. Yeah, they all help. It's not one or the other, absolutely. Yeah. I, I have a very holistic approach in that way too, yeah. Yeah, and I just think there could be someone there thinking, you know what, I might give this a go. Yeah. Like well, I've I been, so. yeah, like that's the whole plan. I might, I like, I might have been busy as to date, but you know, I've got this tiny little patch, and I might put some lettuce in or some cherry tomatoes, just one or two things, and and nurture that and nourish that, and and see if that helps make me feel better. So, so before we say goodbye, you are giving so much. You are always helping other people to feel good with their mental health and their um, well-being and you spend a lot of time out gardening which I'd imagine keeps you quite fit and, and 
active and it's a form of mindfulness. But when it comes to taking care of yourself, what are some of your self-care rituals and things you like to do? Oh, I think um, I think I think getting out in the garden every day is absolutely one of them. Um, and you know, one of my rituals is to go and harvest, even if it's just some herbs, um, uh, but to harvest something each day uh, and connect with the plants. And, and especially at this time of year, when I've got lots of seedlings coming on, uh, to go and sort of you know water them and see how they're. I, I sort of yeah see how they're see how they're growing really um what yeah I, I could take great pleasure from that um I'm also a great one for you know being quite as physical as I can during the day uh though I do uh, far too much of my time is screen based and desk based so I like to walk as well um uh and swim uh, and then I'm a great believer in a, in a really lovely warm bath at the end of the day as well. I find that, you know, in terms of self care, that's one of my 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 um, my my rituals. So, so yeah, all those things. And it's so inspiring, Sue, when you're a psychotherapist, a psychiatrist, and even you can see the actual benefit of working being really busy and then needing to switch off yeah. like from technology or TVs or screens yeah, yeah, and yeah. connect with nature and take care of your own self. And I'm imagining, Sue, as someone who's always busy working and with clients and patients, you must have just felt that distinct switch off like, I often say to people, self-care is so important, isn't it? Especially during these times. Yes, I think that's right. And I think people in the caring professions um, are, are so inundated with work at, at the moment that that is more important than ever, really, to make sure people are finding that, that time for themselves, to replenish themselves, to recharge, you know. Um, and I think the other the other thing that you know, as a family, we always do is to make time to to make some nice food in the evening and and sit and and spend time eating together. You know, I think that's another very important ritual of sharing food and and having that time to connect with each other. Yeah, and I love um, the well garden mine, but it just reminds me of. You can have a whole lot of stress going on, whether that be at work or in your life, and then you can go to this garden and totally get in the flow state, switch off, lose yourself, that ruminating mind about all the stress. Mm. It sort of can just, you know, I guess weed itself away in some <laughs> direction but just give people um, that, even a gap where the mind's not thinking you know that's so it's so incredible and you live this Sue um which is even more incredible um you live it do it um and such a great ambassador when it comes to mental health and gardening so thank you again Sue yeah. you've really inspired me to want to just go out and do more gardening yeah. and um yeah, but I'm sure you're going to inspire so many of our Spirit Girl podcast listeners. If you're tuning in today, be sure. Sue, so how can we stay in touch with you now after this podcast show? Well, I, I have a website. It's it's just um, suestuartsmith.com uh, and I'm on Instagram, I'm on Twitter. So, yeah, people can follow me if they if they like to follow me. Um, but, you know, it's been a real pleasure talking to you today, Yvette. Thank you. Thank you very uh, much. I love it. I love it. And I'd love for everyone to take a photo of their garden and actually hashtag Sue Stewart Smith, hashtag the well garden mind, um, especially if you grab a copy of her book or if you are inspired to run out and um, do something in your garden. I just love to see everybody's garden photos and book photos and um even just to be able to read uh, how it's made you feel. If there's any school teachers tuning in today, 
um, or people that work with at-risk kids or at hospitals. I don't know. It just, your message, Sue, and what you've written in the book and research really feel so empowering that we all have the power to intertwine more of gardens into our life, whether we're developers. Um, there's just so many opportunities. So I feel really hopeful that even in a global pandemic, there are ways that we can really get back out there and um, make a difference. Mm, and in a way where it's gardening or herbs or a little plant for someone, you know, a little plant for someone else's garden, maybe someone we don't even know, maybe we leave it on their garden as a gift. But, you know, there's just so many, um, there's so much hope coming from your book, Sue, and, and from this podcast. So thank you again. Thank you very much. Thanks, Sue. We'll say goodbye to Sue Stewart-Smith. It's been an absolute pleasure having you on the Spirit Girl talk show podcast. Be sure to subscribe, to leave a rating and review and tell someone you love to. And together, let's feel good from within. Bye for now. Bye.